I think what we are discussing this week is how hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people are looking to the ideas of communism. They're indignant and frustrated about society we live in, about what is going on in the world when they open the news, watch, watch what is happening in Gaza and so on. But indignation and, and anger is just the beginning. It's not enough to change the world. What is needed to change the world is organization. So this week we are founding the Revolutionary Communist International exactly for this task, to fight this horrible system and to fight for a better world. Uh, we dedicate ourselves to fight for communism. We are not doing this out of thin air. We are actually basing ourselves on very solid foundations. We are, we are basing ourselves on the great the traditions that came before us and the great lessons. And maybe the most important lessons on how to build a revolutionary communist international is the lessons from the third international, the communist international. <coughs> the international formed by the Bolsheviks, by Lenin and Trotsky in 1919. It is these traditions that we see as our legacy. So we study their history in order to learn from it. And who better to introduce this topic than Fred Weston, <laughs> who, as I have been told, has written a very great introduction to this book, The First Five Years of the Communist International by uh, Leon Trotsky. Fred is a member of the International Secretariat of the Revolutionary Communist International, and he will be speaking for 45 minutes plus translation, and then we go into questions and discussion. So without further ado, Fred, uh, please. Well, <clears throat> now... We are launching the Revolutionary Communist International. It is not a mass international like the Comintern, but we aim to make it that. Now that is going to involve a lot of work, a lot of turns, a lot of tactical questions will be posed over the coming years. And we need to have an organization which is educated in the history of the movement with cadres who understand that and that are cap capable of turning in a flexible manner when necessary. I think we've done a reasonably good job at this present turn, but the reason why it has been so smooth is because it corresponds to the needs of the moment. When something corresponds to the needs of the moment, it's much easier to carry out. But you also need a, you need a certain level of education in the organization. Now, the question is this, how is a mass revolutionary communist international going to be built. It's going to be events that create the mass international. Ted Grant always used to say events, events, events. Without the big events in history, you cannot transform a small revolutionary organization into a mass force. For the consciousness of the masses to, to reach revolutionary conclusions require events which open the eyes of the masses. For example, the nature of the state. We're educated in school that the state is, an, is, is like a, a, an arbiter, a referee that just controls everything, everybody behaves properly. If, you, if any of you have seen the videos of um, interviews with the miners' wives and the ex-miners who were part of the miners' strike in 1984, you will see how they were forced to draw conclusions about the nature of the police. Ordinary working class men and women defending their jobs, were repeatedly, brutally beaten. That changed the consciousness. It created, for a period, what was an insurrectionary mood. It's those kind of events that have an impact on consciousness. More recently, we've seen it in the United States and Canada, the brutal clampdown of some of the encampments. To many of the students who experienced that for the first time, it would have been a revelation. Now, this is just the beginning. This is nothing compared to what will come. Other events that have an impact are things like major strikes, general strikes, sometimes factory occupations when the workers have no other, uh, no other way of defending themselves, wars, major economic crises. All of these have an impact on consciousness. It's when, it's when such big events unfold that large layers of the masses begin to put to the test their own leadership. That's when it becomes evident that they have leaders that are not prepared to fight. And, and, and sharp turns can take place in consciousness. We also have to understand it's not just one single event that changes consciousness. It's a series of events over a period of time. And also, different layers of the working class draw conclusions at different tempos and speeds. Um, for example, today, we have behind us what happened around 2015. We saw an international phenomenon. 
We had Corbyn, but we also had Sanders. We had Syriza in Greece, Podemos in Spain, the Mélenchon phenomenon in France. Um, they all represented in one way or another a change in consciousness. And they were like the focal point for that consciousness to coalesce around. Hundreds of thousands joined the Labour Party because of Corbyn. Hundreds of thousands went to stadiums and big rallies in the United States to listen to Sanders. But in the nature of these politicians, and it's not, this is not a judgment on their individual character. Some of them may be very nice people, but all of them revealed the limitations of reformism, i.e. they thought that you can improve things for working class people within the context of a capitalist system, which is in deep crisis. So that explains why all those movements in one way or another were disappointed, disillusioned, and the same process of, how do you say, gathering of hundreds of thousands was lost and dissipated. A lot of these people are no longer in the Labour Party. Syriza is in a state of collapse. The same with Podemos. Sanders is now just a mildly, mildly left, if you could say that, left dem Democrat. But you see, people draw conclusions from experience, particularly the younger generation. It is because we have that behind us that the, the Are You a Communist campaign was so successful. I remember getting the reports. We went to this demonstration, met a bunch of young kids, and they'd say, are you socialist? Well, I'm not a socialist. I'm a communist. And we had that repeatedly. Young people draw, have drawn the, a layer, a layer have drawn the conclusion that the socialists a la Corbyn, a la Sanders, don't fight. They compromise. They want something more serious. And that shows you how an idea, which the bourgeoisie with its massive um, resources in terms of media, the education system, etc., thought they had buried once and for all, and yet that idea keeps coming back. The reason for that is because the ideas of genuine communism are the only ones that can explain the crisis that we're in and what needs to be done. Now, so we have the big events that have an impact on consciousness, and they will be the events which will transform the small revolutionary communist parties into much bigger organizations. But in order for them to be able to play that role when the time comes, there's, there's a long preparatory period of the, the work of building a sizable CADA organization that can become a point of reference when the masses begin to move. Therefore, what I'm saying is this, the creation of the future mass revolutionary parties <coughs> will be a combination of the subjective and the objective elements, the educated cadres and the events in which to intervene with those cadres. Now, events are beyond our control. We cannot, we cannot manufacture crisis of capitalism, and we cannot man manufacture a general strike. These are objective processes that unfold from the situation. But we do have control over the building of the cadres. Now, that is the work that Lenin dedicated himself to from the 1890s until the Russian Revolution of 1917. You see, if you look back then, Lenin was a great theoretician, but at times he had a very small force around him, was in exile, working against the stream. He could not um, reach the masses. You see, we have to exclude the idea that the Revolutionary Party can win the masses in times of relative stability of the capitalist system, i.e. when capitalism can grant concessions for a lengthy period of time to the working class, well, in such times, reformism dominates the movement, as was the case in the latter part of the 19th century and the first decade of the 20th century. We also have to remember that even at the outbreak of revolution, reformist ideas dominate the movement. If you studied it, in February, the Bolsheviks were not the majority of the working class. It was the Mensheviks, the social revolutionaries, who had the, the, the majority. But you see, revolutionary events accelerate the process, as Ted used to refer to, sharp turns and sudden changes. Um, he used to repeat that often. That is what we're preparing for. We already see that. We're in the midst of that already now. Now, the process began with the the outbreak of the First World War. War eventually radicalizes. And if you see the events towards the end of the First World War, you see the beginnings of revolutionary movements. We, ha we had it in Russia. 
You also had similar movements in Italy. You had the German Revolution, 1918, then Hungarian, 1919, etc. Now, you see, big events in one country can trigger international revolution when the conditions are ripe. That was the role of the Russian Revolution. But there's, there's other moments in history. May 68 was not just a French phenomenon. We have the Mexican 68. We have the Pakistan 68. Why in the same year, or at least the same period? Because the, the, the system is global, and, the, and the, the events are international. Because it's the crisis of the system as a whole that then produces similar events in individual countries. Now, at the base of the Comintern was the experience of the Bolshevik Party. Uh, Lenin often said to the communists of other countries, less applause and more study. Study our experience. Study how we achieve that party. You know, we know, we know the history, the 1903 split, <clears throat> um, the period of working as a faction in the same party as the Mensheviks from 1906 to 1912, and then 1912, the final break, the discussions on how to apply the tactic of the United Front that the Bolsheviks developed. So there were plenty of lessons in the history of the Bolshevik party for the soon to be born communist parties to study. And it was this rich experience of the Bolshevik party, which would form the theoretical basis of the third communist international, at least in the days of Lenin and Trotsky. And this is very clear. If you look at the debates that took place in those congresses, those first four congresses, what it, what it, that experience shows that theory was the fundamental bedrock upon which the organization was built. Now, as I said, it's the objective situation that it permits small revolutionary forces to rapidly transform into mass revolutionary parties. But without revolutionary theory, that potential cannot be realized. Look at what happened in Russia after February 1917. The Bolsheviks inside Russia were succumbing to the pressures of the moment. They were leaning towards support for the provisional government. There were plenty of practicos involved in that. It took the theoretician, Lenin, to guide the party in the correct direction. Without the theoretician, Lenin, there would not have been the Russian Revolution. And without the educated cadres in the ranks of the party, he would not have had the, the, the party with which to apply that theory. When the First World War broke out, we find Lenin studying Hegel. You think, there's a war going on. Why is he reading Hegel? Well, it was the dialectician Lenin who was capable of um, understanding in February what the policy of the party should be. He put February in the context of the, the process, and he could foresee how things would develop and change, how the same working class, which was supporting the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries, would learn from the experience, would draw conclusions, and consciousness would change. In that situation, you have to be able to resist all the pressures of the, of the mass movement, because if you don't, when the masses do reach the revolutionary conclusions, you will not be the revolutionary party that can lead the class. That's why we dedicate so much importance to theory. Without it, these big mistakes can be made. Now, Lenin spent a lot of time in the heat of revolution writing books, you know, We've been criticized by people because we produce a lot of books. We're book readers, bookworms. I've even heard us called as Alan and Ted were referred to as mere theoreticians. Well, they, they can live in that world. We live in another one. Um, Lenin wrote the April Theses in April 1917. He wrote Imperialism in 1916, published in 1917. He wrote State and Revolution in August, September 1917. On the eve of revolution, after the revolution, in the middle of the Civil War, he wrote The Renegade Kautsky. He wrote many texts on the national question in 1914, 1916, 1917, in 1920. He kept coming back to this important question. In April and May of 1920, he wrote Left-Wing Communism, an Infantile Disorder. This was for the, the Second Congress of the Comintern. Lenin paid a lot of attention to theory right in the middle of major historical events, because he understood how important it was to educate and guide the cadres of the international. You see, one of the problems the Comintern faced in its early days was that whereas the Bolsheviks 
had drawn lessons from ex experience, such as, for example, the need to apply the United Front tactic in an intel intelligent manner, or the need to work even in the most reactionary trade unions, or to do parliamentary work. It's quite funny, actually. When Fiona announced that she was standing, I saw one stupid comment on one post. Ha, 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 the Revolutionary Communist Party standing in elections. Ha, what revolutionaries. And I thought, Jesus Christ, over a hundred years since Lenin wrote all his texts, we still have such idiots. Um, but they are caricatures of caricatures because there were some important figures in, in that period leading mass parties who were ultra left. We had people like Bordiga, who was to become the leader of the Italian Communist Party. We had one individual, a Dutch guy called Hermann Gorta. He, um, he tried to reply to Lenin. He, re he replied to his left-wing communism in an open letter to Comrade Lenin. Basically, he was saying, we shouldn't participate in elections. We should boycott parliament. We should split the trade unions. This became so bad that amongst the German communists, there were people who actually believed um, that we should have, they, they should have a rule that members of the party should not join trade unions. In fact, the split in the German communists was over the 21 points. The famous 21 points included the need to work in the trade unions. Um, and so you had this pro problem of ultra leftism and sectarianism. This phenomenon has existed um, ever since those days in different, in different forms, some more extreme than others. Now you see, where did this ultra leftism come from? Well, if you look at the, the German SPD, they had gone through a period of decades of significant economic growth. They had managed to develop as a mass force, but the impact of, of the development of capitalism on the consciousness of the leaders of the social democrats was to push them towards the idea that capitalism could now be reformed. Um, they then went on to betray the revolution at the key moment. And that's why you had the other phenomenon, the opposite of opportunism, you could say, which is ultra leftism. It was a reaction against that opportunism. Now, Lenin considered that a healthy reaction, but nonetheless, he defined it an infantile disorder. You know, an infantile disorder is something you grow out of. But you know, in psychology, there are such phenomena which are due to the fact that certain individuals were not allowed to mature in psychology. They seem to be blocked at a certain phase of development. And they have an element of the child in them, in their thinking. It creates some rather weird and wonderful people. And in politics, this is, this is a similar phenomenon. Some of these communists remained in the infantile stage of the movement, incapable of understanding um, what was really necessary. That explains why Lenin wrote left-wing communism. He dedicated a lot of time to editing it personally and making sure that it was ready and printed by the time of the Second Congress so that every delegate had a copy in front of him when he sat down at the Congress. That was how important Lenin considered this question. That's why we've republished the book and we're insisting that all comrades read it and study it. Now, in the first four Congresses of the Comintern, that is the founding Congress in 1919, then the second in 1920, the third in 1921, and the fourth in 1922, Lenin and Trotsky played a leading role in, in, in attempting to educate these parties. We could say that in some of these Congresses, they would enter the Congress probably in a minority position on several questions. They didn't use organizational measures. They used the art of debate. They intervened and explained patiently to educate the ranks of the international and to win over the ranks. Um, now, I haven't got time to go into the, all the details of the debates. So that's not my purpose here. But the first Congress, which was rather a small event, was basically announcing the international. It exists. We're here. They published the manifesto, and they invited all the healthy revolutionary forces to, to, around the world to join them. In the second international, we see how it, it's developing, and the leadership is elaborating in depth a, a number of questions. You see the internal debates. Some of the left communists were talking about the imminent collapse of capitalism. It was Lenin who warned them that although the system was in crisis, the, cap the system could recover and could avoid revolution. This depended on the Revolutionary Party. The subjective element played a key role 
But they discussed questions such as the national and colonial questions. To be honest, um, it's, it's the communists that developed a genuine revolutionary policy on this. You know, in the Second International, you had theoreticians, so-called theoreticians, who raised the idea that because capitalism was still going through a, a, a progressive stage, then the, co the, col the, colonial the colonization of the world was a progressive role of capitalism in um, raising these, these people to a higher level. It was the Communist International that developed a revolutionary position, and they discussed questions such as the role, the role of the communist parties in these countries, the question of the nature of the bourgeoisie, what tactics they should adopt. Um, these were, were discussed. They also discussed at the second, uh, in the build-up to the Second Congress, um, the need to clarify who were the genuine revolutionary communists and the opportunist elements that had managed to get into the international. I just want to quote Trotsky on this. He talks about um, the ranks of the communist international are made, need to be made accessible only to those collective bodies which are permeated with a genuine spirit of proletarian revolt against bourgeois rule. He talks about um, there is no room left not only for turncoats and traitors, but also for spineless skeptics, eternally vacillating elements, sowers of panic and of ideological confusion. He says this cannot be attained without a constant and stubborn purging from our ranks of false ideas, false methods of action and their bearers. Trotsky um, wrote many articles and gave many speeches in, in the early days of the Comintern. Now, it was at the Second Congress that they discussed the 21 conditions. And what, what I just quoted from Trotsky was written before the Congress. Now, why were these conditions elaborated and voted on? I will, I will go into the details of each party later on. But um, a number of parties had come over to the international from the second international and they brought with them their right wings lenin and trotsky understood the need to purge the right wing from the international i'm not going to list all the conditions there's no time for that but condition number two refers to to methodically remove reformists and centrists uh, this actually created a polemic inside the parties which i'll explain later but there's a number of conditions which were necessary to set down uh, a line of demarcation between revolutionary communists and centrist reformists, etc. Um, they're available. You can find them and you can read them and study them. It, 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 you could have a whole branch meeting just on three sheets of paper. At the Second Congress, they discussed the question of the trade unions. This was also discussed at the Third Congress. The question of um, how to work in the unions was raised. The question of uh, factory committees, uh, rank and file bodies, and the radicalization inside the unions. At the Third Congress, they also discussed the question of, there's, a, there's a, re a thesis that's called Methods and Forms of Work Among Communist Party Women. It actually st starts off with the first paragraph saying, all the communist parties of the West and the East need to increase work amongst the female proletariat. It raised the idea of organizing special apparatuses inside the party and establishing special methods of approaching women. But they insisted, of course, that the emancipation of women could only finally be achieved in the course of the um, uh, transformation of society. Um, again, worth reading. It has lessons for uh, today. We also published a whole book on women in the Russian Revolution, which covers a lot of, the, uh, of, the, of that period. The Third Congress also discussed the question of the youth of the party. They, it highlighted the, uh, the great, greater radicalization of the youth in that period and the need to organize amongst the youth, to educate the youth, um, and also to have a youth, uh, kind of a youth international of the international. Um, in some countries, in fact, the, the youth sections of social democratic and socialist parties passed en masse to the international. In some countries where only a section of the party joined the Comintern, the youth totally joined. It showed you the, the greater le degree of radicalization amongst the youth. The Comintern Congresses were really a school of communism. They analyzed the ups and downs of the movement 
For instance, the discussion on the relationship of the economic cycle to the class struggle. You know, combating this simplistic approach that crisis always means class struggle and recovery means social peace. They explain from a study of, of, of the history of the movement that that is not always the case. Um, Trotsky, for instance, um, explains that it depends on the context. If you've had um, a period of severe recession, deep slump, which can paralyze the working class in certain moments, when millions of workers lose, are losing their jobs, how do you strike against the boss when he's sacking you? You can occupy the factory. But in general, there are periods we've seen where a deep slump can, in the first instance, actually has the opposite to what some people think. Instead of pushing the class struggle forward, it's, it works like a massive break. And Trotsky pointed out that it's when the recovery starts after such a period that you can have an outburst of strikes and class struggle. You know, when in a factory, they've gone through a period of job cuts, job cuts, job cuts, and then the boss takes on 10, 20 workers, the workers get a sense that they're more powerful now. Now's the time to strike. And so you have this seemingly paradoxical situation of an economic recovery and an outburst of class struggle. Now, it, this, was a, this is just a little example of their attempt to educate the ranks of the international. Now, I can remember when I read this by Trotsky, I remember thinking, yeah, I know that, because I can remember my dad saying, they always want to go on strike when the boss is cutting back. We should hit the boss when he has orders on the books and he has to deliver the goods. So when I read Trotsky, I thought, yeah, yeah that makes sense. A lot of workers actually live this in their, in their lives and, and they live this as an experience. Um, and Trotsky uh, was educating the, par the parties in this kind of thinking. You see, dialectics involves contradiction. And if you understand dialectics, you can also understand such ideas. And you can understand where things are going, even though they may apparently seem to be going somewhere else. But you can see the process as a whole. Now, I strongly suggest, when you have time, I know there's a lot of reading to do, that book by, uh, by Trotsky, The First Five Years of the Comintern, it is rich in theory. And for example, there's, the, uh, there's a text there from a speech by Trotsky in July 1921 called A School of Revolutionary Strategy. Um, and I will read two quotes. Young comrades with little experience in such questions should apply themselves to a study of historical works in order to master the factual material pert pertaining to the history of different countries and peoples particularly and especially their economic history. Only then is it possible to attain a more concrete and clearer, clearer conception of the inner mechanics of society. This mechanics must be clearly understood in order to apply Marxism correctly to tactics, i.e. to the class struggle in practice. You see what importance he gives to theory, to study, to reading, in order to be able to act correctly in the class struggle. Talking about the young communist parties, which were inexperienced, this was actually the tragedy of the whole period, in fact. He says, it would be a mistake to expect of these young and just risen communist parties um, that they immediately master the art of revolutionary strategy. And he says, no, last year's tactical experience testifies all too clearly to the contrary. And the Third Congress came to grips with this question. Anyway, read the book. I know it's a big one, but, you know. Um, again, in an article called Flood Tide, where he, he discusses things like the economic cycle and the class struggle. He discusses the bourgeois maneuvers. He discusses the question of ultra-leftism. Um, he, he makes one important comment. He says this. Had there been in Germany in 1918 and 19 a communist party com comparable in strength to that which existed in March 1921, it is quite probable that the proletariat would have, would have assumed power as early as January or March 1919. But there was no such party. The proletariat suffered defeat. Out of the experience of this defeat, the communist party grew up. Once arisen, 
If it tried in 1921 to act in the manner of the Communist Party, sorry, if it tried in 1921 to act in the manner that the Communist Party should have acted in 1919, it would have been battered to pieces. This is exactly what the last World Congress made clear. So you had living revolutions taking place, and the, Comin the Comintern in its congresses was discussing this, discussing the mistakes that were made, the possibilities that existed, and what should be done. The question of the United Front tactic was a key element in the debates. The United Front tactic, as elaborated by communists, is a tactic which is the final aim is to win the masses away from the reformists. And you don't do that in a sectarian denunciation of the, of the reformist parties. Lenin actually said you should offer the leaders of these parties united front in struggle. When the communist parties are too small, you cannot lead the proletariat. But you can approach the proletariat in a dialogue, stating your program and aims, and showing that you are actually prepared to struggle in practice side by side with the workers in the trade unions and the, and the reformist parties. And in the process, experience will show who has the correct program. That's what the Bolsheviks did in 1917. That's how they were transformed from a minority to a majority of the proletariat. Um, we have the example of the advice they gave the British, the young British Communist Party. At the Fourth Congress in, in 1922, they discussed this and they gave advice. I think the same Lenin that had carried out, had led the revolution in Russia, what did he say to the British communists? This is what the theses say. The British communists must launch a vigorous campaign for their admittance to the Labour Party. The British communists must do their utmost, whatever the cost, to extend their influence to the rank and file of the working masses, using the slogan of a united revolutionary front against the capitalists. Now, Lenin was not advising the British communists to do this because he had concluded the Labour Party had the right ideas. It was the opposite. But he had an understanding that the British working class was still massively gathered around the Labour Party. And what was required was a period of patient explaining, avoiding ultra-left mistakes, and getting close to the ranks of the Labour Party. Time would show the limitations of the leaders of the Labour Party. And on that basis, it would have been possible to win a large layer of the ranks to the ideas of the Communist Party. Um, I've quoted this already, sorry. Um, the Communist International then faced another situation in 1922. By then, in effect, the wave of revolution had receded. Think about it, in Italy, the rise of fascism. And in many countries, you see a decline of the movement. And there's a counter-offensive of the capitalist class everywhere. Um, an attack on wages, hours, There'd been struggles for the eight-hour day, and now a pro the opposite process began, with the capitalists taking back what they'd been forced to concede in the, in the 1918-2021 period. Now, going back to the question of events, as I said, events prepare the conditions for revolution, and it's the crisis of capitalism that prepares those events. Now, these are the objective prerequisites for revolution. Um, the class struggle builds up over years and decades, and it, sometimes it can seem as if nothing is moving. But then you have periods of intense crisis of the system. Now, here, a theoretical discussion on Marxist economics may seem of purely academic interest, but it is not. It has very practical consequences, because if you understand how the capitalist system works, you can see all the contradictions which will produce crisis in the future. Now, sometimes that can take decades to work its way through. Now, unless you have a, a rock-solid understanding of Marxist economics and the, and the contradictions of capitalism, in such periods, you can succumb to the pressures of bourgeois society. When capitalism has been booming for 20 years, you can draw the conclusions that, well, Marxist economics is nonsense. The system has found a solution to the crises. That's actually one of the key elements in the degeneration of the parties of the Second International. But it's also what strengthened reformism in the post-war period, the post-Second World War period, and see what impact that boom had on so many so-called Marxists. I've given other talks on the history of our organization. They're available, but you can see what, 
wonderful and crazy ideas emerged on the left in that period. It was because they had lost confidence in the ideas of Marxism because reality seemed to contradict Marxism. So understanding how the system works allows you to keep that perspective that at some point this system is going to enter into a deep crisis. Now today, who can, qu who, who can deny that the system is in crisis? Just look around the world. We discussed it on the first day. The crisis which we had always maintained would at some stage unfold is unfolding now. And in moments like that, the passage from the stability of the previous period to the instability produced by crisis has a massive impact on consciousness. And you can actually see leaps in consciousness. Um, now, one expression of the developing consciousness of the working class is the growth in its organizations, its mass organizations. For example, in Britain, in the period just after the First World War, you had a massive strike wave. 35 million working days lost in 1919, 86 million days lost in 1921. The unions grow massively on the back of this wave of strikes. The unions in Britain in 1914 had just over 4 million members. By 1920, they had 8.3 million, more than doubling. Together with this, there was also a massive increase in support for the Labour Party. Germany saw a revolution in 1918. And then a growing strike wave, 1919, 1920, 21, 22. Note this little figure. The socialist trade unions in 1918 in Germany had 1.6 million members. In 1919, just one year later, they had 5.5 million. That is a massive surge of the working class into the trade unions. And there were other millions members of other unions. In Italy, the Italian Socialist Party in 1918 had 60,000 members. In 1920, 210,000 members. The CGL, the main socialist trade union, in 1918 had 250,000 members. In 1920, 2.1 million, almost growing 10 times. There was a huge surge in membership of the unions and the more advanced elements joined the Socialist Party. Think about it, the Socialist Party of 1920 was very different to the party of 1918, mainly young workers who joined the party. There was a massive strike wave, 1918 to 1920, that culminated in the occupation of the factories in September 1920. Now, figures like these that I've given for Britain, for Germany, for Italy, France, could be seen everywhere to one degree or another. There was a massive growth in the, in, in the mass organizations, an influx into the trade unions and into the parties. Now, if you were a Marxist, a revolutionary Marxist, at the time, this would not be a surprise to you because it's the natural consequence of a crisis of the system. But what happened is this massive surge of workers into these organizations, which was a reflection of the radicalization of the working class, entered these organizations that had reformist leaderships. They entered because they wanted to fight. They discovered that the very leaders that they turned to were putting a break on the movement. This produced a radicalization within the ranks of these parties. Left currents emerged, and it was from within these parties, from these left currents, that the mass forces of the future communist parties were to come. In Germany, in France, in Italy, this was the case. But it's interesting to look now at the details, some of the details of how some of these parties were created. You see, there is not a one-fits-all formula there's no way of saying, ah, this is the way they were formed, and this is the way they are going to be formed. We can take a few examples. France, Italy, Germany, Britain, China. I have an interesting book here, which is basically the minutes of the Congress of Tours, 1920, with the speeches in that Congress. An interesting read. What you see is a conflict within the Socialist Party on the question of whether to join the Comintern or not. They had two Congresses that year. One in the spring, where they decided to send a delegation to the Soviet Union and to come back and report at the National Congress at the end of 1920. These guys were keen. They, um, they started the Congress on Christmas Day, 1920. Maybe we should do that. The weather would be cooler, and maybe we'd get a cheaper price. How many people want to come here on Christmas Day? Anyway, jokes apart. Um, they had a Congress, and they had the reports from the Soviet Union then they debated, 
And it's interesting to see the interventions in favor of Russia. What it meant was they wanted to, to join the revolution. They wanted a revolutionary policy. Interestingly, the, the youth of the party had already decided to join the, the Communist Youth International a few months before that Congress. But there were others who intervened who say things like, well, yeah, yeah, R- Russia is very good, comrades. I understand why you, you like what's happening in Russia, but we should really be looking to Britain. Basically, they were saying, look to the British labor tradition. They were trying to stop the party from joining the Comintern. In the end, they voted to join the Comintern with a 76% majority. That is how the French Communist Party was created, by a radicalization of the ranks of the Socialist Party in a period of intense class struggle in France in that period. And that's how the mass French Communist Party was created. In Italy, a similar process with a slightly different outcome. Comrades may not know that the Italian Socialist Party had already joined the Comintern. It wasn't so much voting to join, but the problem was there'd been a Congress of the Comintern which which had adopted the 21 points. And the question was posed, purge the right wing, purge the reformists from the Italian Socialist Party. And that's what the centrist leadership of the party was not prepared to accept. You had attempts at compromise, which was like, yes, yes, we can join, but with this condition, that condition, they refused to expel the right wing. When the resolution was presented on this and was defeated, the leaders of the left, people like Bordiga and others, walked out of the Congress, walked across the road, I think it was. <laughs> they went to another theater. I suspect they, somebody must have booked it in advance <laughs> and f- launched the Italian Communist Party. And the split went three ways. Just under 60,000 members adhered to the Communist Party. 100,000 were basically the ones that we want to be in the Communist turn, but not accepting the conditions. And then an openly right-wing faction of about 15,000. Now, this is how the Italian Communist Party emerged. It was disappointing to some of the leaders of the Comintern because they'd failed to achieve what they'd achieved in France. This is all happening within weeks of each other. The French Congress was in the end of December 1920. The Italian Congress was towards the end of January 1921. But you see, there there was a similarity. The class struggle, the mobilizations, the radicalization had produced a massive influx of workers into these parties. It wasn't by chance that the youth wings of both parties massively adhered to the Comintern. These were the new, young, fresh layers that had just joined on the basis of the the big surge in class struggle. They were looking for revolution, didn't find it in the leadership of of these parties. And because of the existence of the Russian Revolution and and the founding of the Comintern, they had a powerful point of reference to look to. In Germany... A similar process, although a little bit more complicated and with different detours, we have the emergence of the Spartacists around uh, Luxembourg, Liebknecht. During the war, they create around the Internationale group inside the SPD, which then later became the Spartacists. But at the same time, we have the, 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 a big split in the, in the SPD. In, um, in January 17, the USPD split from the SPD. It was a mass split to the left. The, the Spartacists um, turned to, the, to, the, to this formation at one stage, but init- initially they launched the, 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 the Communist Party of Germany around the Spartacists with other groups like the Bremen group, the Stuttgart group, radical uh, left groups within the social democracy. And by 1919, we have the existence of the German Communist Party. But you also see the problems. That party suffers a split to the left. As I mentioned earlier on, the ultra-left split, and they set up the KAPD, the the Worker Communist Party. But notice, the Comintern accepted this split as a sympathizing group of the international. Lenin could see, we've got to try and win these elements. They're genuine revolutionaries. Lenin's approach was always very clear. Absolute firmness, even in organizational measures, to keep the right wing to keep the reformists out, but had a much more open approach to the ultra-lefts because he believed they were honest revolutionaries that could be educated in the traditions of Bolshevism. And eventually, there's a fusion with the the USPD, which in the process the USPD splits, 
But it's this through, through this process that we see the emergence of a powerful communist party in Germany, the biggest communist party outside the Soviet Union. But notice a similar element. The mass force of this party originated in the SPD. But the same process I described in France and Italy, this mass in, influx of radicalized, angry workers into the SPD produced the forces for the future Communist Party, which was also the combination of the, Sparta, the forces of the Spartacists, who were the, more, the most revolutionary and radical wing. Now, in Britain, this was not the process. They managed to fuse together a number of groups on the left, several, uh, several small groups, and they got them together to fuse into the Communist Party. Some of them are like the British Socialist Party, the Communist Unity Group of the Socialist Labour Party, groups like the South Wales Socialist Society, different groups of shop stewards, workers' committees. They managed to bring them together, and in January 1921, the CPGB was refounded and, um, uh, and became the British section of the international. But they also, even though they were relatively small, a few thousand, had within them the, this infantile disorder, the ultra-leftism. The questions that were being debated were things like parliamentarism, do you take part in elections, and what should be the position of the Communist Party to the Labour Party. Um, Lenin, that's why he wrote left-wing communism again, and he refers to this in that book if you read it. That's the British. Then we have the example of the Chinese Communist Party, a completely different story. It was established in July 1921. The figures I've managed to find are that they had a total membership of 59. I've heard some people say, how can you call yourself a party? You're too small. I don't recall Lenin or any of them saying, you only have 59 members, how can you call yourself a party? It was actually initially based on study groups at Peking University about in, around individuals like, I hope I get this right, Zhen Du Shu. They were mainly intellectuals and students. Um, and that's how the party was set up to begin with. Um, in, in the midst of revolutionary movements, you know, the 1919 May the 4th movement, the ideas of communism started to become attractive to a layer of the youth. And in the two years, 1919, 1920, you had reading groups, study groups, young people studying uh, Marxism. The Comintern paid attention. They sent some of their officials there. And that's when finally, as I said, in, Ju in, in 1921, um, they proclaimed the establishment of the Chinese Communist Party. That Congress was 12 people, 12 delegates representing the 59 members. Now, they announced, that was basically announcing, we're here, the party is here. Uh, Mao Zedong was also present at that Congress, by the way, he was one of the leaders. Now, um, it took them a few years to build up their forces. By 1925, they'd reached about 1,000 members, mainly students, intellectuals. But then came the events. The 1926 revolution and the thousand became close to 60,000 within just over a year. That is how the Chinese Communist Party was created. Now, I don't have time to go into others. I think I'll limit myself to these examples. I've got the others here. But now, why did I pick these different types of these different examples? You see, you have in the first examples I gave, you have the classic idea, the mass traditional party of the working class. The masses go in, class struggle, they get radicalized, a left-wing current develops, the communists become the leaders, and from that, a revolutionary party is formed. You have the British example where it starts with a much smaller force. But you see, Lenin could see the Labour Party would be destined to go through a, a similar process as the other socialist parties. And, fr and from within the radicalized workers around the party, the future communist party could emerge. And that's why he advised them in effect, to apply the United Front tactic in an intelligent manner by trying to enter the Labour Party, in effect. And in China, we have another completely different example. A party is launched, they build it up numerically, and when the events unfold, they transform into a mass force. Now, there were questions such as the attitude to the Kuomintang and all these. I haven't got time to go into that. Now, the reason I've highlighted all this is because this is a precious, a precious lesson from history. We look at history in order to try and understand the future. We, you cannot take it and just superimpose it and say, this is how it's going to be. Events in, have an impact of how things unfold. For example, the, 
when the Labour Party was dominated by Corbyn, it was a point of reference for many, many radicalized young people. That was thrown away by the reformist leaders. The terrain has changed. The Labour Party, they, they, they purged the left. So when you have important changes in the objective situation, you've got to have an organization that is capable of turning and adopting the most effective tactics in any given moment. So will it be like in France or Italy or Germany? Or will it be like Britain? Or will it be like China? Well, the point is this. We don't have crystal balls. You cannot see the details of how the situation will unfold. But the point of this discussion is to educate all the comrades of our organization in the different possible paths, paths from a small cadre organization to a mass organization. It could go one way, it could go another. We could see at some point even the resurgence of left reformism. In fact, I would say it's probably inevitable in one form or another. Now, whether that will come from the existing organizations or from new formations, we do not know. In, in Venezuela, we had the emergence of the PSUV under Chavez around a figurehead. And for a period, that was the focal point of the masses of Venezuela. That was then betrayed, and we know which way that has gone. We've had phenomena like Podemos rising from almost nowhere. Or we had in Greece, Syriza, a small marginal left party, being catapulted to being the majority party of the working class. There are many different ways in, this, in which this process can unfold. But what we can be absolutely sure of is the working class will rise. It will struggle. It has no other way. The crisis of the system will force the workers to fight back. They will, look, they will look for the instruments with which to fight. And when there is no mass revolutionary force, you can have all kinds of accidents which lead to the appearance suddenly, apparently from nowhere, of these mass formations. Now, that's a general picture. We will see how it unfolds step by step, day by day, as, as, as time goes on. But the question is this. In each of the countries you're working in, in some you have these mass parties, in others you don't have anything. The terrain can be slightly different. But in one way or another, a similar process to what we saw in the years 1918 to 21 will unfold. The question is this. Will we have a force like the Bolshevik party or will it be confusion, ultra-leftism, infantilism, like in many of these parties in the early days of their formation? Now, we have the advantage of looking back at history and learning from it in order to prepare ourselves not to repeat those mistakes. But the main emphasis now is build the revolutionary communist parties, build the revolutionary communist international, build the necessary initial nucleus of cadres educated in the theory of Marxism, educated in an understanding of history, educated in an understanding of the perspectives, and build the necessary organization. In Britain, we're over a thousand. And look at what we're achieving with just a thousand. The aim now is to the 10,000. And the same in many other sections. Quantity does have an impact. If you're too small, nobody can see you. We need to become, I'm not saying a mass force, but a recognized tendency. Tendency, I'm using the old word, current. Anyway, force, let's use that, it's a nice neutral word. Parties that are visible, at least to the advanced layer of the working class. A point they can gather around when the events start to unfold. That's the stage we're at now. So build that organization, listen to Trotsky, read the books, discuss them, read the history, absorb a sense of the way history moves. It's got to become part of you an integral part of your thinking. Look out that window and see history unfolding. But also understand that if we build the lever that's necessary, one day we will be able to put an end to the nightmare that this system has become. Thank you very much, Fred, for that excellent leader. So the first speaker will be Tom from the US, 
and you will have 10 minutes uh, and you will be followed by Chief from Mexico. Thank you. Thanks, Comrade Chair. In 1919, the Communist Party was formed in the United States. Well, actually, two Communist parties were formed in the United States. Originally, the Communist Party in the United States comes from three different splits in the Socialist Party of America, as well as winning over the best uh, elements from the industrial workers of the world, the IWW. The Communist Party of the United States basically was built from the left wing of the Socialist Party of America. But prior to 1919, the uh, left wing of the Socialist Party of, of America was never unified as a united left opposition. The left wing opposition itself was divided. They had a group in Massachusetts, a group of Latvians, a group in New York City, etc. In addition to that, the Socialist Party of the United States was separated into what they called foreign language federations. The U.S. working class was an immigrant working class, and the ruling class has traditionally, over two centuries, divided the working or attempted to divide the working class based on race and national origin. These methods by the U.S. ruling class, by the way, um, although it wasn't called this, it actually is the roots of identity politics. Because the Socialist Party um, allowed these foreign language federations, you had the effect of a party that was divided along national uh, origin or ethnic uh, lines. This, this not only divided the, in, in the party internally, but it created these ethnic enclaves where the workers stayed among themselves and didn't try to reach out to the broader American working class. This goes back, by the way, to Engels in, uh, um, in the 1800s, writing to German socialists in the United States, telling them, hey, you may want to consider doing some publications in English to reach out to the other American workers. At the beginning of the Communist Party in the United States, these foreign language uh, federations were incorporated into the party. It took time and intervention from Moscow to eventually take the two different communist parties and get them to merge into one, and to eventually reorganize the party to eliminate these foreign language federations so the party could be united. Unfortunately, this resulted in a leadership in the United States of the United States Communist Party, which was factionally divided. The, there were basically three factions, three hardened factions in the Communist Party leadership. There was no political homogeneity among these leaders. Really, it could be said none of them really understood Marxist theory or the Marxist method. Instead of trying to politically raise the, the, the level and try to win over and convince your opponents, they were involved in various bureaucratic uh, and factional maneuvers. Un unfortunately, in the common turn, that which was led by Zinoviev, Zinoviev also used practices of trying to use organizational measures to solve political problems. And this, and this encouraged the factional leadership to depend on trying to win the support of the common, of the like common turn leadership of Zinoviev, as opposed to trying to convince your opponents of, of why, why they should do what you're, what you're suggesting. All three factions had tendencies towards ultra leftism and, and having a very mechanical way of looking at things. Uh, just to quickly say, for example, in the 1920 election, they, the Communist Party did not support Eugene Debs, who was in jail for speaking against U.S. imperialist uh, war in World War I. And, De and Debs was a supporter of, this, of, the, of the October Revolution from 1917 till the day he died. If the communists had supported him, they might have been able to win him over and win more people over from the Socialist Party. I, I don't have time to read. I don't have time to read it, but they're, they're, you know, they were also very ultra left in the way they in, intervened in strikes. In one of their flyers, they say, stop asking merely for a little more wages. And then they call on the working class to engage in armed insurrection. I suggest that we don't follow that method in our flyers. If, if there's one major lesson to learn from the history of the American Communist Party, it's the need to emphasize theoretical development and theoretical education of the leadership and the cadre. And, and that is a lesson that we are taking to the founding of a new Communist Party this July in the United States.
It's the Revolutionary Communists of America, the sec the American section of the RCI. Long live the RCI. So the next speaker will be Che from Mexico. Be before when I read out, out the list, I forgot Guillaume from France, who I will also try to fit in. But the next speaker is Che, and he will be followed by Tatiana. It's hard to find a country in the world that hasn't been affected for, by the Russian Revolution of 1917. It really changed the course of humanity. And when the Bolsheviks uh, convinced, convinced when the Bolsheviks uh, convinced the German uh, uh, Communist Party to launch the the Communist International, uh, the call to found a, a Communist International created a split in the in the global movement. Uh, it's very well known that the, the socialist parties uh, were removed. We explained this uh, already about the United States, but we saw this also in Argentina. Or in Chile, where there was also a socialist tradition. But it also um, removes the anarchist movement. It's the case of the workers in the world, where there was an influence anarchist. Pero también en México había una tradición. Oh, eh, oh. Es el caso de los trabajadores industriales del mundo. Uh, this is the case for the industrial workers of the United States. Pero también de México donde había una fuerza. But also in Mexico where there was a strong anarchist tradition. México había pasado por una revolución. Tiene muchos matices, pero una la burguesa había vencido. Um, Mexico had also undergone a revolution, but the bourgeois revolution had succeeded. Y se genera una reunión de anarquistas socialistas. En oposición a esa, eh, sí, a la vencedora de la revolución. Uh, and an, an anarchist wing had uh, emerged in opposition to this bourgeois revolution. Había un bolchevique que se había enviado a América, Borodín, y él influyó para que esta asamblea se eh, integrara a la internacional como... Eh, <laughs> Había un bolchevique, Borodín. There was a bolchevik, Borodín. Que influyó para que esta asamblea... Se that, uh, that uh, had an influence on this assembly joining the Communist International. But what we're referring to is a, is a lack of education and a lack of, uh, of uh, cadres who had been uh, trained in Marxist theory. Pero la Internacional Comunista, a diferencia de es una Internacional eh, Mundial. But unlike the first and second uh, internationals, the communist international was global. That's why it's no coincidence that, it's sec that in its second congress, uh, the, um, uh, the colonial question was, uh, the thesis on the colonial question were discussed. Uh, the Mexican delegate was a, a, a guy from Bangladesh. <laughs> And Lenin took the time to discuss uh, with him on a deep level. And uh, from there come the additions to the thesis on the national question. Uh, his name was Manavendra Roy and uh, he never returned to Mexico. Pero de estas adiciones se desprende. No podemos apoyar para nada a la burguesía reformista, por but, ejemplo. ¿no? Uh, but from these additions uh, came the idea that we cannot uh, support the reformist bourgeoisie. Pero bueno, esa es la importancia que la internacional, la internacional dio a estos países ex-coloniales, oprimidos o abiertamente colonizados. Uh, but this is the importance that the international gave to the countries that uh, were formerly uh, or currently colonized. Bueno. Hay que decir que la actitud de la dirección de la Internacional fue primeramente sí puertas abiertas con candados. We must say that the, the attitude of the International was open doors with locks. Cada, cada medida traía posibilidades pero también riesgos. Every measure brought with it uh, possibilities but also risks. Eh, las 21 condiciones pusieron una barrera para los reformistas. The 21 conditions uh, put 
uh, up a barrier for the reformists. Pero no pudieron evitar que hubieran tendencias. But they were not able to prevent that there that there would be uh, some ultra leftist tendencies. Por eso se puso énfasis en la en, en los textos como la enfermedad infantil. Uh, that's why emphasis was put on certain texts like uh, like the uh, infantile disorder. Y se tomaron medidas como un abierto trabajo parlamentario revolucionario para también purgar de los elementos todavía anarquistas. Um, and emphasis was made on the uh, el trabajo parlamentario on, revolucionario. On parliamentary work to, um, to uh, undermine these ultra leftist elements. Pero lo, lo que vemos también en América Latina, ya lo dije, es una falta de cuadro. But what we saw in Latin America is, uh, is a lack of uh, political caters. La Internacional Comunista eh, también atrajo, por ejemplo, a sectores del movimiento estudiantil. Uh, the Communist International also uh, attracted uh, layers from the uh, student movements. Hay un importante movimiento iniciado en Argentina, que es la reforma universitaria, que también se extiende a países como Perú, como Cuba. Uh, there was also a movement uh, in Argentina, the reforma universitaria, the university reform that spread to countries like Peru y Perú y Cuba. Uh, Perú and Cuba. Y, por ejemplo, ahí vienen elementos eh, como Aya de la Torre, eh, María Tegui o Julio Antonio Mella. And there come, uh, and from, from there come uh, certain elements like eh, Alberto de... Aya de la Torre. Aya de la Torre. Julio Antonio Mella y José Carlos María Tegui. Eh, y, y bueno, en, en el seno de esta izquierda estudiantil también se dan debates y Julio Antonio Mella arremete contra Aya de la Torre, que estaba representando a sectores... <risa> perdón. En el seno de esta izquierda estudiantil se dan debates. Uh, within this uh, student movement, there are a series of debates. Y uno muy importante es entre Julio Antonio, uh, Julio Antonio Mella y Aya de la Torre. And a very important one was between Julio Antonio Mella and Aya de la Torre. Que Aya de la Torre tenía una posición antiimperialista, pero en el fondo defendía a una burguesía nacional. Mm, Aya de la Torre um, ultimately defended uh, national bourgeoisie, even though he was against... Eh, estaba en contra de... Eh, del imperialismo, yeah, uh, against imperialism. Eh, y, y bueno, Julio Antonio Mella, basándose en la ciudad de la Internacional Comunista, planteó una política de independencia de clase. And Julio Antonio Mella, uh, based on the uh, ideas of the Communist International, uh, uh, supported a position of uh, class independencia de clase, in class independence. Si uno mira figuras como mm -hmm. Mella o José Carlos María Tegui, realmente son hijos, son los cuadros que formó la Internacional Comunista de Lenin y Trotsky. Uh, if we look at uh, individuals like María Tegui and María Tegui y Julio Antonio Mella, and Mella uh, we can see that these were the caters that were developed by the International of Lenin and Trotsky. Eh, bueno, uno puede leer a Mella y no puede encontrar una sola vez escrita la palabra Stalin. Um, you can read Mella and you will not find written uh, the name Stalin even once. Pero sí se pueden encontrar varias frases favorables a Lenin y Trotsky. But you can find lots of uh, sentences and extracts favorable toward Lenin and Trotsky. Pero estos dos personajes, Mella y María Tegui, también fueron atacados por la Internacional Comunista Estalizada. Uh, but these two characters, María Tegui and Mella, were attacked uh, by Stalin's uh, degenerated uh, Communist International. Y bueno, sufrieron también de la marginación eh, por otros elementos también institucionales. And they were also uh, marginalized by regional and international and other regional and international Stalinist elements. Bueno, a Mella se le... Un, un tipo, Stiner, un suizo burócrata que estaba en el Partido Comunicano. Es uh, Stiner, uh, a Swiss bureaucrat who was in the uh, Mexican Communist Party. Decía que Mella solamente reproducía las palabras de André Unín. Uh, said that Mella just copied the words of André Unín. Y que eran realmente las palabras de la oposición. Uh, which were really the words of the left opposition. Yo, yo termino diciendo... Eh, I'll conclude by saying... Las ideas del marxismo de Lenin y Trotsky penetraron de forma muy lenta a, a América. Uh, the ideas of Lenin and Trotsky penetrated very slowly in the Americas. Y no eran accesibles para la mayoría de militantes que se acercaban a la internet. And they were not accessible to uh, the majority of militants who uh, drew near to the Communist International. Algo que evitó un desarrollo sano también fue la falta de cuadros. Uh, something else that uh, prevented the healthy development was the, the lack of uh, good uh, caters. Pero hoy nuestras generaciones, la nueva generación, tiene estas ideas en sus manos. But the new generation has these ideas right in their hands. 
Y creo que tenemos que sacar también las lecciones importantes. And I think we need to extract uh, the important lessons from this. Tenemos una excelente revista teórica, tenemos podcast. We have an amazing uh, theoretical magazine and even podcasts. Tenemos libros, tenemos libros que podemos descargar en línea en cualquier parte del mundo. We have books and also ebooks that we can download anywhere in the world. Y tenemos que apoderar, apoderarnos de esta teoría. And we have to take command of this theory. Porque basta que en un país la clase obrera tome el poder. Because it's, uh, you know, as long as uh, the working class takes power in a certain country. Para transformar el mundo. Uh, this is, would be enough to change the world. Pero para ello necesitamos los cuadros, la palanca, para poder concluir la tarea. But uh, for this we need uh, political caters, which are the lever that can accomplish this task. Gracias. Thank you. So the next speaker is Tatiana, who will be followed by Arturo. In 1923, we, in Germany, there was a real chance for a successful revolution. It was a very turbulent year with hyperinflation, mass poverty, great desperation and frustration in the working class. Okay. Uh, it was a very turbulent year with hyperinflation and mass poverty, and it led to great desperation and frustration. The working class began to look... Um, To, to look for a way out of their situation. And the anger also was boiling amongst the petty bourgeois. And the situation became so intense that there were the several government crises. And uh, the KPD, on the other hand, was already a mass party at this time. And more and more workers turned to their direction. And uh, more millions of workers, especially in the trade unions, were already under the influence of the KPD. And there was a factory council movement which was leaning strongly towards revolution. In this situation, a revolutionary leadership that focused all this energies, all its uh, on the preparation of the uprising and seizing power was needed. Uh, because of some ultra-left experiences of the years before, the KPD leadership had followed the United Front tactic to win over the masses, which was absolutely correct and necessary. Now the objective, objective situation has changed and they needed to prepare for the offensive. A massive strike wave broke out during the summer, culminating in, in a general strike against the bourgeois government. However, the KPD and the leadership of the Comintern misjudged the situation and remained hesitant. This led to another bourgeois government as the KPD uh, had not seized the opportunity for revolution. After this, discussions uh, began in Moscow uh, about preparing about preparations for the uprising. And there was a possibility for it in October, but the K KPD leadership relied uh, on the wrong forces. They thought it would not be possible to organize a general strike without the KPD on, the, on their side. But there was a real mood for revolution within the working class. However, the KPD called the uprising off and missed the chance. By this time, Lenin was already seriously ill. And the conflict between Trotsky and the Troika consisted consisting of Zinoviev, uh, Kamenev, and Stalin, already existed. As a consequence, the personal interests of the Troika were in the center of the discussion, and it, and it became an obstacle. For example, the KPD leadership asked Trotsky to go to Germany and help the comrades to prepare for the uprising and taking power. But Zinoviev who was, uh, was firmly against it, because the masses had not forgotten the role of Trotsky uh, in the Russian Revolution. And from Zinoviev's point of view, another success uh, would have strengthened his position enormously. And so they sent out some less experienced comrades. After the cancelled October, Zinoviev agreed with the tactics of the German comrades. And in the, begin and in the beginning, there was no real criticism. But the mood changed when Trotsky sent a letter to the Central Committee. And he denounced the bureaucratization in the party. Um, this was the first time this conflict between Trotsky and the Troika was out in the open, and it was joined by a letter from 46 leading comrades expressing the same doubts. And it led to an intensified uh, polemic uh, with even discussions in the Pravda. And Karl Radek, who also had uh, great relations with the German leadership, um, sided with the left opposition. And because of that, Zinoviev felt threatened and, and feared an alliance. And this led to 1923 becoming the central debate within the Comintern leadership. But instead of an honest debate and drawing the necessary lessons from the catastrophe, people were covering their tracks. And Zinoviev in particular was more interested in his own position. 
And he now began to attack the German comrades and blame the leadership of the KPD alone. And uh, I don't have time to, to, to do the rest, <laughs> but uh, basically the defeat of 1923 sealed the fate of the world revolution and sealed the isolation of the revolution in Russia without a successful revolution in more advanced countries. And it allowed a privileged bureaucracy to merge. And it marked an important turning point. Uh, the, and the commentator no longer discussed what would have been necessary for the world revolution. Today, we base ourselves of, of the first four congresses of uh, the commentator of Lenin and Trotsky. And we are building an international in which we have honest debate and we are discussing the lessons of our experiences and not on the basis of personal interest and prestige, because it depends on this whether the future revolutions will be successful. Thank you, Tatiana. The next speaker is Aturo, and he will be followed by Guillaume from France. Now, um, the days of the October insurrection shook the world, as John Reed famously put it. Uh, and this was not just, uh, it didn't only enthuse the, the activists, the leaderships, but also the masses. I've got a little quote here from a contemporary witness from uh, southern Spain. He was a liberal uh, lawyer, and he's talking about the year uh, 1919 in, in, in Andalusia. He said, in my frequent encounters with workers, I could, notice, I could notice their heightened enthusiasm. All conversations inevitably moved on to the Russian question. If we were talking about farming, immediately someone would ask, what is sowed in Russia? Does it rain a lot there? If we were talking about the weather, the question would be asked, is it cold or hot in Russia? Or in any other context, where exactly is Russia? How long will it take to get their own food? <laughs> Russia was an obsession that would never, never leave people's mouths. Now, you can see that there was widespread enthusiasm, but also a lot of uh, con con confusion, evidently. And this confusion really also extended to the, to the activists. Fred spoke a lot about the social democrats, how they, how they split along an, op an opportunist and an ultra left wing. But social democracy is only uh, part of the, of the story because the third international was a much uh, bigger phenomenon, actually, than the old second international. The Comintern won over lots of uh, nationalists, especially in the colonial wor world. Uh, the May 4th movement in China has been mentioned. Also, Roy in, in India, he came from a, a terrorist background, actually. The, the Comintern also attracted some, some former feminists like Sylvia Pankhurst in, in Britain. And the anarchists played a big role in some countries. Che mentioned that in America, in, in Portugal, the, the Portuguese Communist Party was created by anarchists. They, they were all enthused by the Russian Revolution, but th they were very confused. And I'm going to quote Victor Serge, who was a witness at the Second Congress of the Comintern, and he put it very, very, very clearly. He said, outside of Russia, there were no real communists anywhere in the world. The bulk of the men at the Congress were symptomatic of obsolete movements that had been outrun by events. And, and big strides were made in the way of educating this, uh, this uh, new generation of, of revolutionaries in the ideas of Marxism and in the methods of Bolshevism. But all things considered, this proved uh, insufficient. Communist parties were put to the test in important countries. In Italy in 1922, when faced with the rise of fascism, Tatiana mentioned Germany in 1921 and again in 1923. We could add Bulgaria in 1924. These parties were still uh, uh, unexperienced. And, uh, but the, the, the biggest test for these parties actually uh, came from a different uh, direction. It was the rise of, uh, of Stalinism. Most Stalinists, uh, um, uh, most parties were, were won over en bloc from, to, to Stalinism, in fact, in the mid 20s. They, there was no organized resistance to, to, this, uh, to this process. Some isolated leaders uh, were, were, were resisted. Uh, che mentioned Andre Unin, uh, Julio Antonio Mella. We could add uh, Shen Du Xu from China or Osniblit from, from the Netherlands, Rosmer. But, the, but the, the parties as a whole were, were conquered by the Stalinists. And this has to do with the, the great authority that the Russian party had in their eyes. That had been, that had been a, a positive feature in the early days, but it turned into its opposite later on. It turned into blind obedience to the Stalinists in Moscow. Now we have to understand that, that, that a movement, an, a, an organization can develop uh, by leaps and bounds, can develop very quickly. But unfortunately, the training of the cadres proceeds in a much more linear way. You can't really speed it up artificially. It takes uh, years. 
And, and the, the main handicap of the Comintern is that in 1917, the, Bol the Bolsheviks were isolated. There were no communists elsewhere in the world, as, as Serge put it. And I think uh, this goes to answer the, the criticism that Rosa Luxemburg made initially to the founding of the Communist International when the idea was, was first uh, sounded. She said uh, the International uh, must uh, grow out of uh, revolutionary events. It cannot be uh, proclaimed. But this, this is clearly wrong. You need to organize beforehand. You need to train the cadres internationally. And this is our task uh, today, to do what, what Lenin did in Russia over 15 years, but uh, across the world. So when the key events that really drive forward, that really help develop the mass uh, Communist Party, when, when the, these key events break out, we, we have a critical mass of, of revolutionary Marxist cadres in the key countries. Thank you, Arturo. The next speaker is Guillaume from France, followed by Emma from Austria. Uh, as Fouad said, in 1920, a majority of uh, Congress delegates of the French Socialist Party voted to join the Comintern. This is the birth of the French Communist Party. A minority opposes it, and this provokes a split. The Congress, uh, the, this Congress of Tours was a consequence of two big historical events. World War I and the Russian Revolution of 1917. Uh, in 1914, uh, the leadership of the workers' movement voted for war credits and support in is its own bourgeoisie. At first, this uh, position has only met a weak opposition inside of the workers' movement. The main opposition inside of the trade unions and the Socialist Party came from the pacifist uh, movement. This uh, tendency supported uh, war credits in uh, parliament, supported participation of socialists to war uh, government, but was abstractly arguing for a quick and fair peace. And Lenin and Trotsky were uh, bitterly uh, criticizing this current, who was in fact acti acting as kind of a left-wing shield for the social nation nationalists. To the, to the empty words of pacifism, Lenin was uh, opposing the slogan of transforming imperialist war into a revolutionary class war. This pacifist wing of the Socialist Party was le led uh, partly by a guy named Frossa, who became next uh, chief of the French Communist Party. As uh, atrocities of the war became known of the masses, uh, this pacifist wing uh, gained ground. Russian Revolution had a big impact on the uh, European workers' movement. In France, some of the ex-pacifist and ex-nationalist uh, socialist party leaders want to join uh, the new international. Uh, in fact, this was the result of the big pressure on them coming from the basis of the workers' movement, who was moving quickly to the left. This was, this was the case of uh, Frossard and Chauvin, who was uh, an ex-pacifist and an ex-nationalist, who, as Fred said, came to the Second Congress of the International. And they were met uh, very coldly Cold, coldly by the Bolsheviks, who uh, reproached them the attitude during the war. And, but these were uh, convinced opportunists, so they said what the Bolsheviks wanted to hear. And they came back in France with the aim of bringing the Socialist Party into the new international. The Bolshevik leaders had no illusions in these opportunist leaders. But they, they couldn't, okay. but they couldn't reject them because behind them were the mass of socialist and trade union uh, activists and sympathizers. Uh, 25th of December 1920 uh, began the Tour Congress. And uh, different tendencies were there, reflecting different class interests. 
There was an open opposition to the new international, the right of the party led by Léon Blum. The center of the party was divided in two tendencies. The right wing of the center was accepting to join the international but refusing the 21 conditions. And in fact, they were refusing uh, the revolutionary content of these conditions. And the leadership of the Communist International refused the integration of this current inside the new, par the new Communist Party. So the two left currents, the left current led by Lorio and Souvarine, and the left wing of the center led by Frossard, gained a wide majority. Uh, the split was a solitary one. It was necessary. The French Communist Party was born with uh, Frossard as his new general secretary. And, but the Bolsheviks knew that this split alone was not sufficient to pass from, according to the words of Lenin, from an, from an old type of European parliamentary party to the new type of communist party French workers needed. The Tour Congress was a step in this direction, but only a step. And was what, what was needed was to correct quickly the, fail, the defaults inherited from the old Socialist Party. Trotsky was following uh, the development of the French Communist Party uh, for the Communist International. Uh, one of the main uh, worries of uh, Lenin and Trotsky was the trade union questions. Because hiding themselves behind the idea of trade union independence, communists were refusing to work openly in the trade unions. They were refusing to openly criticize reformist trade union leaders as uh, Léon Jouot. But uh, politics uh, doesn't tolerate uh, emptiness, void. And if the trade unions are not under revolutionary communist uh, influence, they fall under another influence, uh, that of the bourgeoisie. Trotsky and the leadership of the new international uh, put uh, attacked on other issues. Uh, social composition of the party with uh, not enough proletarians. A necessity of a tighter control of the parliamentaries, uh, uh, papers, and apparatus of the party. Uh, also, Trotsky uh, explained to the leadership of the party the necessity of United Front tactics and many other topics, but uh, I have not, not the time to develop. But as soon as 1924, the offensive of the Troika, Kamenev, Zinoviev, Stalin, began to uh, make itself felt inside of the Communist Party. Under the guise of Bolshevization, uh, internal democracy was liquidated, and the new leadership of the party uh, fell into a succession of uh, zigzags and uh, mistakes. And then the French Communist Party leadership uh, betrayed at a number of times during the century, in 36, in 45, in 68. Today, the French Communist Party is uh, fall on, it, on itself, is uh, in ruins, uh, trapped into alliance without principles with the Socialist Party. But the fight of the most uh, honest uh, elements who uh, founded this party is still here, and these ideas who, uh, put, uh, who contributed to the, co to the creation of this party are still here. These are the ideas of the first four Congress of the International Communist. Communist. These are the ideas of our International, Revolutionary Communist International. And these will be the ideas of the French Revolutionary Communist Party that we will found this coming fall. Thank you.
<clears throat> the next speaker will be Emma, and depending on how long he speaks, we might have time to stand on from the US. We might not. Okay, I try to speed. Uh, comrades, I'm intervening in order to to highlight the relationship uh, between events and party building uh, in the period of preparation. And I, I tried to do this by uh, connecting Lenin's activities in the First World War with the start of the Austrian Revolution in January 1918 and the, the founding of the Communist Party in November of the same year. It's not only interesting to read uh, Lenin's books that were always uh, uh, written for a clear uh, political, uh, political purpose, but especially in this period, it's also interesting to read uh, his uh, speeches, articles, pamphlets, and letters. When the war broke out, uh, first of, uh, the first thing was that Lenin was completely puzzled, and it took him a few days to understand uh, the, the real amount of capitulation that took place uh, in the international movement. And uh, the first thing uh, then when he understood he sat down was a characterization, the characterization of the war. Very clearly said that, uh, analyzed that this is a reactionary imperialist war with no progressive content whatsoever, which sounds fully normal to us today. But uh, as today, uh, back then in 1914, there was a lot of confusion in the movement on this question. For example, in Austria and in Germany, uh, the old leaders, basing themselves from picked quotes from Marx and Engels, uh, said that this war has a progressive character because the most reactionary uh, power in Europe uh, is Tsarist Russia. And in Russia, they said, this is a war for the liberation of our Slav uh, brothers and sisters that are oppressed by the Austrian Empire. So Lenin said, no, this is all crap. This is a reactionary imperialist uh, war. And then he starts uh, by basing himself on the Basel Manifesto of the old international of 1912, even if it had an ut ut utopian character in parts. Uh, that, uh, but he, he used this Basel Manifesto in order to put heavy political fire on the social chauvinists from Kautsky downwards. Basically, what he did was that uh, he gave a political content to the splits that happened uh, already to the movement. And he, clue, he drew a clear political line of divide uh, into the movement between the social chauvinists and the internationalists. This is also why he wrote the book Imperialism, to fully finish up with Kautsky. And Lenin very soon came to the conclusion that rebuilding the international means a full break with social democracy and building the communist international. Already in 1914, he uses this term. But then Lenin also engages in practical political work. We, we all know he is in Switzerland at this time. And he uses the initiative of Grimm, the, the grandfather of the Swiss labor movement, uh, of this peace, peace conference in Simmerwald. Um, so Lenin was not, uh, he, he believed that the manifesto of Simmerwald is not uh, enough, and he added uh, his own uh, notes uh, to it, uh, where he declared that the aim of all the internationalists must be to turn the imperialist war into a, a civil war. Then there is, uh, and this was added to the notes of the Congress. Then there was Quintal and Stockholm, the, the 1917 Stockholm, where the Bolsheviks immediately left because this conference had a different character, a uh, uh, pacifist character, basically. But in any case, with the protocols of Simmerwald, they, they somehow made it uh, to Vienna, and they came into the hands of Franz Coricciona. And he read these Lenin uh, notes, and he made sure that he uh, can participate in the upcoming conference in Quintal, 1916, where he established a relationship with Lenin. This was a youngster of 24 years old. Uh, the Communist Party of Austria does not like to speak him very much because they sent him to the concentration camp by delivering them to Hitler where he died in 1941 in Auschwitz. In any case, uh, Cory Chona uh, was a delegate of the uh, Action Committee Left Radicals, a group of less than 100 uh, radical uh, young uh, workers and school students. And with the inspiration of Lenin methods, with Lenin's appeal, um, they started to make more bold initiatives. They started to organize, to, to politicize the food riots that started in winter of 1617. And in autumn 1917, uh, they uh, linked up with new uh, young labor activists of the metal and ammunition factories south of Vienna, also youngsters in their 20s. And they decided uh, to call for a general strike. 
uh, which was influenced uh, by the uh, Brest-Litovsk Breeze Peace uh, uh, Treaty and underlines the correctness of Trotsky's attitude towards his peace uh, dealings. Yes. The strike spread like a wildfire, involving more than one and a half million workers uh, spilling over to Germany. It lasted for more than two weeks, and then there was also a muti mutiny in the fleet. And the uh, emperor brought in the official social democracy to control it. Soviets were formed everywhere. So through social democracies, through the social chauvinists, they could re regain control. And now these, uh, these comrades, they were, even if they had uh, guts and were real heroes, but they could not withstand uh, the pressure uh, of the state and the tasks coming on. So the organization was smashed in the coming month. So the Communist Party in November 1918 uh, was built by uh, uh, Zufällig, uh, by random uh, intellectuals. <laughs> but still, they built successfully the party with the IAC methods. They just put posters and in one day, one, 100 people, hundreds of people signed up in the big centers and in the army because people were coming back from, from the front. However, also this intellectual fully incapable, so the, the party could not uh, gain uh, a majority in the class. Just the last idea, uh, if you, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> we have to point out, uh, um, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, they were real heroes, but they, they, they made a mistake. They had a very individual approach and they were not so hard on the question on the world. They did not organize the fraction. They did not organize the, they did not, they did not, uh, do what Lenin writes in what to be done. And they paid with her life. And the, and the Communist Party in Austria as well, uh, uh, in Germany was, it, it was, it was not a party with, uh, forged leadership. And also these teenagers and youngsters in Austria, they were really heroic, but they had not sufficient time to politically train themselves and were smashed by the states and by the tasks ahead. So comrades, uh, I'm sure this will not happen to us. Forward. Yes, well, 15 minutes is not much. It's actually seven and a half because of translation. So I won't be able to deal in detail. I think comrades have added a lot of important points. What actually happened in the French party? What happened in Germany? Uh, the colonial question, etc. All very useful additions to the discussion. Um, I had a lot more material, for instance, on how the communist parties came into being in Latin America, how the communist party emerged in Brazil in the 20s, in Venezuela. They're all based, that you, you, when you look at them, they are all connected to the ongoing class struggle that developed in these countries. The Comintern actually had departments for each region of the world with cadres dedicated to, to trying to develop the first nuclei of the communist parties uh, around the world. And that's a task we also face today. But the key to building the organization always starts with the ideas. Comrades ask, how do we build in this part of the world or that part of the world? Well, we start by having good analysis, articles, material that explains what's happening in those countries and offers a perspective. The strength of our organization is in its ideas. A comrade from Germany described the defeat of 1923. The defeat of the German working class in 1923, or the, or the events of 1923, if you think about it, it's a key moment in world history because that defeat marked the, the, the end of a period and a, a, it opened a period where the Soviet Union was isolated and then the material conditions then emerged inside the Soviet Union for the bureaucratic degeneration, which was reflected in theory as well. It's, it's not by chance that within a few months of Lenin's death, Stalin adopts the theory of socialism in one country. What did that idea reflect? It reflected the rise of a bureaucracy that had no interest in promoting world revolution, but enjoying the benefits that they'd um, uh, uh, acquired, let's say, as a bureaucracy. But we see the, the zigzags and the swings that then begin in the international. In the late 20s, they abandon the, popular, the, 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 the United Front. They swing towards ultra-leftism, completely forgetting the lessons uh, learnt in the first four congresses. 
You can read it. You can read a text by Trotsky on this. It's called the Third Period of Comintern Errors. It's a, it's a key text actually in understanding this process. And then you have the rise of Hitler and the swing in the complete opposite direction towards popular frontism. They never went back to the United Front of Lenin. Popular frontism involved collaboration with a with a section of the bourgeoisie. But think about it. It was a return to the mistakes that some of the some of those Bolsheviks were were about to make after February 1917. Trotsky tried to maintain the lessons of that period and to defend the heritage of Lenin. But the, the defeats of the revolution meant the revolutionaries were isolated. Now, more than one comrade has given a picture of different countries where there was confusion. There were elements who joined the Comintern without a full grasp of the traditions of Bolshevism, and they made mistake after mistake. The people that Guillaume referred to in France and the mistakes they made facilitated the process of so-called Bolshevization in 1924. You can see these un some, some of these uneducated um, communists very easily followed the, develop the, the Stalinization of the international. Now, what all this teaches is this. A number of important mistakes were made in that period. You see that in Italy, you see it in Germany, you see it in Hungary, which meant that a historical opportunity was lost. The world could have been transformed in the 1920s. We could have been living here today celebrating a hundred years of communism. We would not be discussing the Holocaust. We would not be discussing the butchery of the Second World War. We would not be discussing the many defeats of the working class, the wars, the civil wars, the coups, which is the history of the last century. We'd be in a very different position. But you cannot undo history. But what you can do is learn from it one of the big lessons we need to learn from this experience is that we need to build the cadres, educate the cadres, build the sections of the international, build the framework for the future revolutionary mass international long before the events unfold. As a, other comrades have said here, we need to do what Lenin did in the, in the years before the Russian Revolution. There was another phenomenon which developed in the 20s which is a key element in the degeneration of the international, the phenomenon of Zinovievism. It's not always easy to detect when it's developing around you, but there's one characteristic that it has, the tendency towards m organizational measures to solve what are political problems, backdoor maneuvers and prestige politics, the prestige of individuals. And usually it's the the prestige politics is a characteristic of people who have lost their bearings as Marxists, have lost sight of what our task actually is. It's not to promote individuals, although individuals also play a role, as Plakhanov very skillfully explained. Lenin was an individual, but he encapsulated the whole experience of the movement. He concentrated the best of the ideas. But it's not about promoting the personal prestige. It's about developing an organization which has the correct ideas and the correct method to take these ideas into the working class and develop those parties that the working class needs. It is about the future of humanity. It is about whether we are going to go through the same period, make the same mistakes, suffer the same defeats. But this time round in history, it would be a true tragedy and it would lead to a barbaric situation for humanity. That's what should concentrate the minds of comrades. The way the, the, the international that Lenin had built ended was with Stalin simply dissolving the organization without even bothering to consult the sections. Because in reality, what he dissolved had already died politically over a decade previously. But dissolve the international, which reflected the fact that the bureaucracy had no interest in promoting world revolution. And yet, if you go back to Lenin, a, a text he wrote in 1919 called The Third International and Its Place in History. This was just as they were founding it. The texts of Lenin are imbued with internationalism. I'll just quote one paragraph from this text. For the continuance and completion of the work of building socialism, much, 
very much is still required. Soviet republics in more developed countries where the proletariat has greater weight and influence have every chance of surpassing Russia once they take the path of the dictatorship of the proletariat, i.e. once the working class is in power in the advanced capitalist countries. That never materialized because of the weakness of the forces of genuine Marxism. But we are founding this organization to retie the knot of history. Our slogan should be, back to Lenin, forward to international communist revolution.